Isn't she? That's the only prayer he hears. He doesn't hear the prayer of the pride, the prideful and the arrogant. But it's the prayer of the destitute. And that's what he delights to do is, and this is foreign to most of us, it's foreign to the, the spirit of this age, which is everything outside of Christ, isn't it? That he would bring us, and he would delight to bring us to a despair. That we have become despairing even of life itself. That's what Paul said. That was his own testimony. He would be despairing even of life itself. And that's God's delight to bring us to that place. Not for his purpose, but that we would see that man, there's nothing in man that can help or please God in any way. That he would bring us to the end of our own strength. And isn't that how he's going to redeem Israel in the end of, at the end of the age? It's when she has come to the end of her strength. It says when he sees that her strength is weak. And this is what this wisdom, or wisdom of this age currently um, lives for now, isn't it? Is being strong and holding it together and just, just muscle through, man. You can do it. But God says you can't. So this is, it's interesting, this is kind of all playing into what I wanted to share today, which came to me at about 7.50 this morning. <laughs> so let's just pray. Um, Lord, we just thank you for your word today. Lord, help me share it. And... and Lord, even if it doesn't make sense to us, amen. It doesn't have to make sense. None of this have to, has to make sense. But it's only you, by your grace, that you can reveal these things to us, Lord. That a man can have nothing unless it's revealed from above. So, Lord, we, we thank you today that, Lord, even with this word that you'd be able to instruct us, teach us, that we'd have ears to hear, Lord, that we would be like Moses, that we would turn aside to see. Keep us from overlooking and and turning away from the very things that you're trying to reveal to us, Lord. May we gaze, Lord, intently into your glorious presence. And Lord, give us eyes and ears to hear and see, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I know we've, I've spoken on this theme before and I've I think it's time to come back to it. It's interesting that I had a conversation with a friend of mine that I'd met a number of years ago now up in Darwin. And, um, and he was telling me that he feels to leave his chosen career to, to go into ministry. He's not sure when, but he, he feels this, this tug in his heart this, this pull towards ministry and and is happy to quit his career, quit his job and and just trust God for God's provision for him. And and Amen, you know, it's good. It says in First Timothy chapter three that he who desires to be a bishop desires a noble thing. So that's that's good. Amen. And so I've, I've been on a mentoring relationship with him now for about a month. It started at Auckland International Airport, standing outside on the phone. And, um, and we just had our concluding uh, talk on Friday afternoon that went for three hours. And I didn't... It wasn't meant to be three hours. It was meant to be 20 minutes, but it became three hours because I was, I guess, foolish enough to go and press a button that I didn't think should be pressed um, in the natural, but I knew God was asking me to ask this man 
this very question about even the motive of wanting to go into ministry. Who's going to ask that question? Everybody applauds. Yeah, yeah, amen, brother, go. You know, there's even a title of a book here. Where did I see it? This one here. I don't agree with the title. It's probably a really good book, but... <laughs> <laughs> Love says go. How many pastors and leaders have you heard say, just go? Isn't that what the gospel says? Go into all the nations? Just go, man. Whatever you do, go. But I'm that, I'm that guy who will, who will go, really? Is that God? Is that, is that sent? Is that something that God at this time in your life is saying, go? Has he sent you? Or is this a self-sending scenario that we can all point to if we're really honest with our own lives and hearts? our own personal train wrecks of sending ourselves or watching other ministries that are self-sent end up in a heap. And, and so the Lord would have us go to Exodus chapter 3, which is some of the most powerful um, statements that God has made concerning the apostolic thing itself, which... To be apostolic means to be sent, amen? Yeah. Apostolos means to be sent, a sent one, a messenger. So Exodus chapter 3 verse 1, and we'll just read down to probably, I don't know, maybe verse 9 or something, maybe a bit more, we'll see. Now Moses was keeping the flock. Let's stop there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. All right, let's take up the offering. We'll go home. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Moses was keeping the flock. Now, that's something that's precious to me. That's, that's you in your workplace working for your boss. That's you feeding your family, um, making lunches for your children. That's you mowing the lawn when you don't feel like it. It's the mundane, it's the very thing, the very present reality that's around your life that God would have even Moses <coughs> keeping the flock. There's something about that. There's something about what is mundane and monotonous and boring and altogether um, loathsome often is where God himself would come and reveal himself to us in the most powerful way. Can we just think a little bit, fast forward 1500 years when Jesus himself was being heralded by all the angels of his first coming when he was born. Remember the angels cried out in a loud voice and with the revelation of Jesus' first advent or his first coming go to it was the shepherds yeah when God reveals himself he often does it in a most hidden way and, and through the most mundane and, and who were these men that he revealed himself to the, the night shift shepherds. These are the back of the clock guys. These are the guys that are on extra money because no one wants to work that time of night. I've done night shift. Been there, done it. Anybody done night shift? It's not pleasant, is it? And yet, that was considered a lowly role, being a shepherd. In Egyptian mindsets, that was a scummy job so the Lord Jesus would have the revelation of his first coming, I'm not saying the Lord Jesus is something that's little okay, Christ, God himself, wonderful counsellor everlasting father yeah would reveal himself to creation in the flesh to lowly shepherds night shift shepherds And we get that out of the first couple of words. 
this is why it takes time to read scripture. You can't rush through this stuff. And this is this whole story about looking at Moses' life and what was he doing? Being turned aside to see. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb. So other versions will say the back of the wilderness. This is this is the back of nowhere. This is this is the back of Blackall. Yeah? Bar Calden. Outside the back of Chinchilla. <laughs> Yeah, Kanamala. Um, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire and in the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, a bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw, he turned aside to see. God called out to him of the bush, Moses, Moses. That's interesting right there. It says, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why the bush isn't burned. And it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out. God had to wait to see Moses turn aside first before God would speak. Isn't that interesting? He re- requires something of man to even turn aside a a sense of um, response to to God's revelation and man more so as the age draws to a close we're going to see more burning bush encounters as a church I can just think of one burning bush encounter right now. <laughs> Anybody think of one that we're currently dealing with? Yeah, COVID-19 maybe. Could that not be a burning bush thing that God is asking us to turn aside and see and go, what is this? What meaneth this? What about the Holocaust? Was that not another burning bush thing? Like, whoa, what is this? Six million Jews killed? Could that not be a burning bush encounter as well? And yet, sadly, the church are all too polite and, and self-respecting to even look at those things. What Holocaust? What, you know, Spanish Inquisition... You know, what horror stories, you know, Croatian genocides, you know, whatever, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. We're all too polite and, and we're all too busy trying to get our ministries established to, to actually see what God is doing on the earth. Coronavirus. That's not from God. God would never do that. Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> Doesn't it say that what goes before him is plague and pestilence that's in scripture that's in your bible and yet we deny it and go no it would never be God really <clears throat> that's not a sermon um, and then he says in verse 5 um, do not come near take off your sandals for the place which you are standing is holy ground And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the land, or out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flown with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. Just mark that right there. I will send you to Pharaoh. 
that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you. I have sent you, underline that one, and when you have brought out the people of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. It goes on. You'll find there's five times that God says, I will send you. I will send, I will send, I will send, I will send, I will send. Do we get that? Do we hear that? I will send, says God. So this, to me, is front and centre of, of all ministry, of everything that is New Testament and apostolic. What is truly apostolic is something that is truly sent of God, the issues from God, that it's initiated from God, not because of what we see. But doesn't it say that, wasn't it because of what God had seen was happening to his own people in Egypt? So God says, I have sent you. One of the things that struck me was God didn't debate with Moses when he says, who am I that I should go? Notice God didn't argue with him at all on that. Yeah, Moses, you're nothing. <laughs> yeah? Sorry, no, Moses, you're a man of outstanding credentials. You've come from Egypt. You were the prince of Egypt. You were trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. You'll read that in Acts chapter 7. All Moses' qualifications. He was highly trained. In fact, Moses' nobility was the very essence of what it meant to be Levitical itself and priestly. But the problem is, just like Moses, our personal qualifications are our disqualification for ministry. Moses wasn't qualified. Moses was nothing before God. It took 40 years to, to empty Moses of all his qualifications. 40 years to empty him of all his um, humanity and his ability, his strength, to go and fix something. Moses wasn't allowed to go based on even the sentimental feelings of his own people suffering. And yet, we think it's okay. Oh, look at all those poor people in India. Let's raise some money, and then let's all go to India and save all the starving children in India. Or let's go and save all the Aboriginal children up in North Queensland. Look at the horrors that are going on around us. Well, let's go and fix them. See, this is the great problem. This is the great conundrum that's in front of us. The problem is, is our seeing. We see stuff that's broken around us all the time, and it's in the heart of man, carnal man, to go and fix it. See, Moses leapt out and killed a, a man based on what he saw. He was unsent. And the problem is when we're unsent, we do, we're going to do the same. We kill in the name of Christ. We kill and we bring loss to people's lives when we're unsent. When we're moved by our own identification or concern for things, all we do is minister death. 
that's intense, isn't it? And I had to say this to this guy who was doing this amazing course. So I kept asking him about this course, and the course that he's doing is a is one of the most recognisable qualifications you can have as a Bible college course to do. This course will get you into the biggest churches in Australia. This course will get you into the biggest ministries around the world. And that's the problem. Because it's based on my qualifications, my networking. And yet, the desire is right. The desire to go and serve God, I believe, was sent. I believe that's God's desire that he's placed in this man's heart. I concur with that, identify with that. I believe that's God. I believe it's Christ. But the, the method and the mode to achieving that I believe it's got a question mark over it. There's some taint of human effort. And any taint of human effort on it is its own disqualification. Even the qualification you're seeking is a disqualification. See, we don't go based on what we see. We go based on his sending. He says, I will send you because their cry has come up to me. Yeah? I will send you because their cry has come up to me. Not because it's come up to you. See, we don't see the cry as we ought. We think we do. So let's fast forward to Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul, Acts chapter 13. There's a consistency right through Scripture. That's why we love Old and New Testament. Yeah? It's all interconnected. It's not finishing at Malachi and the grace grace starts at Matthew and ends at Revelation no grace and truth was revealed in Christ pre-incarnate Christ well before Malachi ended, amen so Acts chapter 13 I think it's in the verse verse 2 or 3 set apart for me here it is, verse 2 set apart for me Barnabas and Saul I will just stop there for a second. <laughs> Don't you love just stopping at the beginning of something? Just getting started, man. What are you doing? Just read the whole thing, will you? <laughs> Set apart for me, says God. I believe they were already set apart. They were set apart from that congregation already as unto God, as believers as men who had already given their lives to Christ in fullness. It was no new thing to their heart. I believe they could have been set apart to God right there and then, or they could have remained worshipping with the rest of the church. It wouldn't have meant anything to them. They were just as much worshippers in rest in Christ, whether they remained or whether they were set apart by God. They were already set apart in their hearts as unto the Lord. They'd already laid their lives down. That's why God elected and God chose them for that job. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Here's this old funny saying that says, you know, you hear this in church all the time. You know, the apostle, uh, no, Saul became the apostle Paul because God had transformed his life. Which, this is Acts 13, man. Right. Like, no, God called him Saul for the work of the ministry. He didn't call him Paul. So take your church funky ideas and throw them out the window. So we make stuff up 
And then we repeat stuff that's been made up, and it's not even true. Saul was Saul to God, just as much as he was Paul to God. Peter was the same. Cephas. That we make things up and we we get all confused. And then we repeat the error. The Holy Spirit here is saying, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. What work had he called them to? Wasn't even identified. Nothing. Just set apart for me these two men. To do what? I don't know. It doesn't matter. To set me apart to do whatever God calls me to do. You don't need to go and rush off to do a Bible college course now because God's called me. See what I'm trying to say here? It doesn't matter where they're even sent to or when they were to be sent. It was just God had set them apart and was now sending them out. And after they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them out as if God was sending that's why laying on of hands is really important. That that's something that's done prayerfully. Yeah? Not rush just because there's need. Oh, so and so is going to the going to the nations to minister. Let's get around them and let's get some food trucks in and raise some money for them and you know, really give them a good send off. And let's not do it next week because we won't have time to do all that. We've got to, you know, get the Facebook marketing going, Instagram going, start another website for them. And, and once we've got all that in place and we've got the correct amount of funding, then we can give them a really good send-off. Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul didn't even know where they're going. Or for what purpose? They had no idea. It's not recorded in scripture. Set apart for me. God will do the sending and not ourselves. And then he will reveal what we're being sent to. It's quite important when we look at the servant songs of Isaiah as well. It says, I can't remember which one it is, it might be Isaiah 42, where it says, Who is blind but my servant? See, our problem is, in the church of Jesus Christ here in Brisbane in 2021, is we see. <laughs> That's our problem. We see. We ought to be blind. Who was the most blind person in all of Scripture? Was it not Christ? Was he not the most blind? I know it sounds like a crazy thing to say. But he was blind. He was blind to the natural. He did not judge according to what he could see, but what his father told him to see or showed, revealed to him to see. He heard the very things that came from his father to go and do. See, we go and fix stuff. Well, brother, there's, there's some real poor people in Sandgate. I'd really encourage you to get into going to help them and serve them. Maybe, you know, on a Saturday, start cooking some sausages and some snacks and you can get around them and love on them and, and really develop your ministry towards the poor in Sango. I've had the pastor come and tell me that. That that's what this church needs. We need to do that to be, to be relevant and to be seen to be helping the poor. Look blankly and go, what are you talking about? Jesus said you'll have the poor with you always. See, the problem is, 
is our disposition to go and do something just because there's a problem, just because there's something that needs to be fixed, just because we feel like it's the right thing to do. But we need to wait until God sends us and that will keep us from the last day's deception that is, I believe, present now. The wisdom of this age will keep us from from this from this waiting time from this this place of rest the wisdom of this age is always going to be pushing to do look brother look at the problems out there you need to go and fix them look at the lost on the street look at that poor girl over there she looks you know really troubled go and minister to her And we respond out of what we see rather than what the Lord sees. So I spent I spent three hours in this phone conversation and it was intense and there was times there of long pauses. I would make a statement like, are you sure that your motive is pure before God for this for this course even I've got no doubt with the call of God over your life for ministry but why are you doing this particular course surely when the Lord prepares his man or his woman of God he does it in the wilderness he does it in hiddenness How many came out of the school of the prophets that ever did anything for God? Give me one name. Anybody got one name of any man or woman of God that came out of the school of the prophets in the Old Testament? And yet, God would find people that would come out of the wilderness out of the back of the mountain the back of Horeb (laughs) a man tending sheep for 40 years you get less for murder isn't it 7 years? isn't that a life sentence? I think in low states it used to be 20 plus I so, some other states was it actually like fucking Yeah. From a prince of Egypt to a ship in Egypt and said, it's a stench of their nostrils. What a demotion for 40 years. Yeah. And that was true. The guy was still And that's what it takes. And it took 40 years to, to rid Moses' own self-belief and qualifications and it takes that for us as well I'm not saying it's going to take you 40 years but the Lord showed me the Lord showed me a vision in 1999 of going to going to India and ministering to Indians and and I prayed about it and I really believed it was God. An opportunity came a couple of years later. Chris, come to India. You must come. It's going to be such a blessing. You want to see the miracles that go on over there. And you just got to walk past them just about. And they all fall over and they all get healed. And, you know, it's just, it's so good. You've got to come, got to come. And my pastor at the time said, I don't believe it's God for you to go. And yet I was quite keen. I was going, yeah, this would be awesome, you know. I was, so I went, went and submitted it to him more out of, um, you know, it seemed to be the righteous thing to do. Go and at least show that you want to submit to him. But really, my heart was already in India. I was already, I bought the tickets. I hadn't actually bought them. But in my mind, I'd already bought these tickets. And I was already on the plane, you know. I'm, I'm just really looking forward to going. 
And and when my pastor said to me, I don't think you're ready for it, and I don't think it's God right now. That's a hard thing to hear. It's a harder thing to submit to it. But I submitted to it anyway, and I had to ring my pastor friend and who was moving in signs, wonders and miracles and having a, a wild time travelling the world. And, and I'd had dozens of prophecies at that stage. You're going to go to the nations, you're going to heal the sick, you're going to raise the dead, you're going to travel. God's got a ministry in Asia for you. There's ministry, you know, to these ones and th- those ones. And, you know, it's like, it didn't matter what church I'd go to, someone would, would call me out, lay hands on me and prophesy that same message over my life. And yet any time I attempted to go and fulfill that in my own strength, God would say, no, you're not ready. So it took 19 years before I went to India. And so my first message to the people in India to a, at a pastor's conference in the back of Cardal or somewhere, some corn farm or some I don't know what it was, it was the back of some rice paddy miles from sealed roads. Um, yeah. <laughs> these, um, these Indians are all, you know, waiting for the word of God to come. And I stand in front of them and said, guys, I just want to let you know, it's taken 19 years, and I'm, I repent to you now, um, for the Lord to work his son in me enough to come. I, it's it's my self-life that's probably kept me from you, but 19 years ago I was called to the nation of India, and here I am 19 years later. And, and that's often how it works, but when we get a vision from God or hands laid on us, don't we think, well, that's tomorrow, man. I'm, I'm ready. I'm good to go. Let's go. But the Lord would, would take 19 years to work in my life to bring me to a place to recognize I know nothing. I've got nothing to give. All I can give is Christ. Separate unto me. Men who are already separated unto God. Men already separated from family, loved ones, friendships, religious ambition. Yeah? Still hanging on to any religious ambition? Any spiritual ambition? Yeah, has it died yet? Has that been separated? <laughs> Cut off? Castigated? I tell you the stuff has got to die. It's all got to go to the cross. with this one of the one of the things that I already feel and we touched on it a bit earlier is this this disposition we have to pass something pass something something over so when when God reveals himself it's often in something that is easily overlooked it's a burning bush. It's a bush. What's a bush? Who cares about a bush? And there's often things in our worlds and things in our lives around us right now that are a burning bush that God wants us to look at. And are we seeing those things as a burning bush? Do we bother? Do we even care about what's going on with COVID-19? Have we really considered it spiritually? Have we really thought, could this be from God? Is this God shaking the church? Or is there a scenario in my family that's a burning bush 
something that God is wanting me to look at. It's often in the mundane, it's often in the thing that's even most painful. God would have us look at these things in our lives. But our disposition normally is, as church-going believers is not to look. We disregard things as only mundane, a bush, my job, my relationship and my family, that weird uncle I've got, that weird nephew I've got, that that situation up the road from my house, whatever it is, are we disregarding the very things that God's placed in our lives that we need to be looking at? That's what I was talking about last week with conscience, that it's in this place, in our conscience, that we can, we can overlook God speaking God's not shouting in our consciences most of the time. It's often just a little tug, it's a little pull, it's a little, it's a still small voice. And yet that's often the very thing that is the most easily ignored. It's often most easy to ignore because we've been ignoring it for years. We've trained ourselves to ignore that voice. Other voices, yeah, no worries, we can deal with those. And like I said more recently about outward sin, often those outward big sins that we all, you know, aren't committing now as believers. We're not murdering anybody now, are we? We've repented of that. (laughs) We're not breaking into banks, stealing cars, doing drugs. So we've stopped those things, those self-sins, but they've migrated into other areas of our lives and often most conspicuously into our religious ways and efforts. And it hides. It hides in religion. It hides in my doing, my being. It hides in my relationship in my own families, my own family. I'm nice to people on a Sunday, but people outside of the Sunday or my own family, I'm mean to on a Monday. It's quite funny, I met someone the other day, a believer who's in leadership, who would say that he loves God with all his heart, mind, soul and strength and loves his neighbour as himself. And yet he couldn't really look me in the eye and didn't want to talk to me at all. I haven't seen him for ages. But he was very sheepish and didn't really want to talk to me at all. Why? Because I no longer fellowship in his church. And that's what you do in Christianity in Brisbane. When you leave a congregation, you're now the devil. Yeah? We, I won't talk to you anymore. That's it. Our relationship that we've had for five years prior is meaningless and now you're the enemy I'm not even going to talk like and that's so normalised and yet he will be this morning right now hands in the air worshipping God with all his heart I love you Lord I love you Jesus get up there and share a beautiful sermon on, on the love of God and yet to his own brother sheepishly, awkwardly cowering and and fumbling and stumbling and can't wait to leave. Sad, isn't it? And it happened two times in two days this week. <laughs> it's like God was saying something. It was like, thank you, Jesus. There's a sermon. But let's not pass over these burning bushes and they are often found in the mundane. 
It's while you're out there dragging the sheep up, sheep up the side of the back of the wilderness, driving the kids to school, going through that stop sign without stopping, speeding, being impatient with your family members, friends, people at work. It manifests, self-manifests everywhere, doesn't it? And we need to overcome that. We need to be Christ in every area of our lives, not just the Sunday morning. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for your word today. Lord, we're reminded of Moses and his life. Lord, that you came and found Moses, Lord, in the mundane thing. You found him herding sheep. And Lord, that you will come and find your man and your woman of God at the appointed time, at the proper time. Lord, that we're not to self-send, that we're not to even stand with other believers who believe they are called. But Lord, if they are, that you would give us the courage to stand up and, and question and ask, is this really the right time of God? Has God truly sent you? Because Lord, we know what happens when we self-send when we look at Moses' own intercession Lord, compassion Lord, was, was unquestioned over Moses' life for his own people we don't question his his feelings for his own people at all Lord, that he would go and even slay a man but Lord, so will we do the same thing Lord, if we are moved on by what we see. Lord, we know there's great need out there and the temptation is to go and fix and to do and repair and bind up and heal and and Lord, there's no end, Lord, of, of things that we can go find to fix. But Lord, that to be truly apostolic is to be one that is commissioned by you one that is sent of you, not by some automatic, cheap, shallow, facile statement that we drag out of Matthew 28, go into all the world and use that as our, our soul-sending scripture, using man's sentiment once again. But Lord, that we would consider carefully what it truly means to be apostolic and we can see in Moses' life and, and the apostle Barnabas and Paul's life as well. Lord, that you came and separated, you came and sent, you came and selected. Lord, not at a time of their choosing, but Lord, of your own. Lord, may this remind us, Lord, even this week, Lord, as we go into whatever we're doing this week, in the workplace or at home, in school or or travelling, Lord, that you would remind us, Lord, of what it means to be truly sent. Lord, that we would turn aside and see the very thing that you would have us consider, the very thing that you'd have us gaze into. Lord, whatever that, that bush thing is, that scenario in our own lives, our own walks, that we would come and gaze Lord, that we would turn aside, that we would look to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I bless you today. I bless you for each one. Lord, as they go out and they continue to keep their flocks, Lord, to shepherd their families, to shepherd their jobs, to steward their education, Lord, whatever their hand finds them doing, Lord, that you would give them 
the grace, the enabling power, Lord, to to perform all the tasks in front. Protect each one, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.